So then we thought maybe this isn't coming from the planet. But then we observed this planet again with NearSpec, next slide, but this time at higher resolution, just between three and five microns. And there it appeared again at higher resolution. So that was a confirmation for us that this bump was indeed coming from the planet. So as an observer, I toss the ball to in the court of the theorists. They always have an answer for everything. So we asked them, what will we expect to find at this wavelength that gives us this bump of this size? Well, it turns out, so they got to work, and it turns out that the models that we were using to interpret the atmosphere of this planet did not account for photochemistry. Next slide which is the chemical reactions that happen when starlight interacts with gas molecules in the atmosphere of the planet. And it turns out that when you do account for this, starlight interacts with water molecules that are abundant in the atmosphere of the planet and causes a cascade of chemical reactions that ultimately result in the production of sulfur dioxide. So this discovery alone, this tiny bump, opened up a new field of discovery and understanding of exoplanet atmospheres. So just from this first look with this single planet, the JWST, we are already deepening and expanding our understanding of exoplanet atmospheres. Next slide. And while WASP-39b is one of the best targets to observe because it's one of the biggest and brightest planets, one of the long-term goals of studying and understanding the atmospheres of exoplanets is to push down to smaller planets, rocky planets, that may be similar to Earth. So I want to now talk about the first observations of an Earth-sized exoplanet with JWST, which is called LHS 475b. This planet is about the size of Earth, but it's about twice as hot. Now, we aren't yet at the point with JWST to be able to observe cool and Earth-sized planets, but we can start by observing hot and Earth-sized planets. Next slide. And so we got to work and we observed transits of LHS 475b using JWST, and the data is shown here uh, in the purple, and it shows this how much starlight was blocked by the planet. If we then make this measurement over different wavelengths between three and five microns, next slide, we can assemble the transmission spectrum of this planet, which is shown by the white points here. In order to interpret the spectrum, we then fit the data or compared the data to different models, maybe considering atmospheres made of methane or carbon dioxide, and we also considered the case that this planet, which is very small, may not have an atmosphere at all. That's the yellow line here. What immediately jumps out when we look at this spectrum compared to the spectrum of WASP-39b, which had all of those beautiful bumps and wiggles, is that we don't really see anything. Nothing immediately jumps out. Nothing immediately matches any of the models. Is this spectrum featureless? Well. There's two things that could be happening. One is that this is a small planet, an Earth-sized planet. And recall that I said that the smaller you get to have a planet, the thinner its atmosphere may be. So in that case, we're looking for signals that are about a quarter of a percent in size. So maybe if this planet does have an atmosphere, it's extremely thin and it's just buried in the noise here. The other possibility is that this planet is too small and too close to its host star to actually hold on to an atmosphere if it had one. Maybe if it had an atmosphere, it was blown away by it winds from its star, and it's just a bare rock, and maybe it has no atmosphere at all. So right now, we can't yet distinguish between those two scenarios, but the fact that we can even get down to the precision to talk about this and think about this is huge because this marks a, a start of the era of small planet characterization to pristine detail. And this is the first step in pushing down to characterizing Earth-sized and Earth-like exoplanets. Next slide. And that really will be 
other way. <laughs> and that really will be the focus of NASA's next flagship mission, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which is going to focus on characterizing in depth the atmospheres of Earth-sized exoplanets in order to search not only for what their atmospheres are made of, but whether those atmospheres host biosignatures or fingerprints of life. So while at JWST, we're not yet there to start characterizing cool and Earth-sized planets, we are starting to characterize hot and Earth-sized planets. And we're really laying the groundwork for this next flagship mission that is going to focus on finding Earth's twin planet and maybe, just maybe, find life elsewhere. The journey is just beginning, and the adventure has been very fun so far. I've been really excited from all these discoveries that we've made so far, and I'm excited to see where it takes us next. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Alan. We have a, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions to our presenter here. Afterwards, Dr. Alam is gonna be over in the Science on a Sphere, which is the area that has the big globe outside the planetarium. We're gonna have everyone at the end of the show exit out this side. That will get you out on the main floor next to that area if you wanted to say hello or ask a question or two. But before we do that, I wanted to ask a couple of questions while we have you in front of this audience. Uh, first of all, I know that you're also very interested in visual arts. Is that a diversion? Is there any play way that your love of painting and drawing overlaps with your work as an astronomer? Um, I typically don't uh, do artwork that is related to space, but one of the pieces that I did do actually is a self-portrait uh, against a watercolor backdrop um, of a starry night. And I did that piece, which is actually going to be on display at the Astronomy Discovery Center at Lowell Observatory, which is opening either this year or next year. Oh, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Lowell in uh, Arizona, right? Yes, that's great. Yeah, it's yeah, the Lowell Observatory is where they uh, did the discovery of the, pl of the, na the now dwarf planet Pluto, yes. Uh, now, what was the spark that lit your interest in astronomy. My understanding it is it wasn't like you, from the time you were four years old, wanted to be, be an astronomer. What was it that made you really decide, this is what I want to pursue as my career? Yeah, so I, I think I fell into astronomy a bit later in life. Um, I first was, I was always a very curious kid and always bugged my parents, asking them why about absolutely everything. And I found that physics was, was a subject that really qu like quenched that curiosity. Um, and so I started my undergrad as a physics major and connected with a professor who was an astronomer and she asked me to join her research group. And at about a year into working with her research group, she uh, invited me to go on an observing run. And that was, I was a kid from New York City. I was not used to dark skies at all. And traveling to uh, Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona for the first time, um, it was my first time in a desert, my first time being on top of a mountain, my first time seeing a dark night sky. It was absolutely breathtaking. And that was the moment that solidified for me that I wanted to pursue astronomy long term. That's amazing, yeah. It's, you know, they say that 80% of all Americans can't see the Milky Way anymore, and having those moments where you can get out and really see the, the full-blown sky often has that impact on people. Okay, one final question. I can't let you go without asking about your role as a consultant with Mattel for astrophysicist Barbie. Could you tell us how that came to be? And Zach, could you bring the picture on? <laughs> so, it's true. <laughs> so, I um, am a National Geographic Young Explorer and I've been doing a lot of uh, consultant work with them. Uh, on a variety of different projects, including uh, children's books about space. But my, by far my favorite was this um, uh, gig to consult with the company Mattel, which makes Barbies for their astrophysicist Barbie lines. So they're opening a line of about five different explorer Barbies. Um, and one of them happened to be an astrophysicist and they needed guidance on uh, the, her accessories, her outfit, <laughs> um, so I got to style this Barbie and uh, dictate what 
uh, was in the box with her, which was really fun. And in order to say thank you, they sent me a, a one-of-a-kind look-alike Barbie of me, which she saw. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you again. Another round of applause for our wonderful speaker. <laughs> if you do have, if anyone does have tickets already for the following show, the one right after this one, you can stay in your seats if you like, and we'll collect them in between. We're going to again ask you to lose the upper right-hand door for the exit. Dr. Alam will be in the Science Center Sphere area just outside of the planetarium if you wanted to say hello. And thank you again. Hope to see you here on August 3rd. Thank you, everyone.